basketball i also think with film you want them to answer questions so instead of me telling them everything you have to ask them what they see and i think that's how learning really helps them and it also keeps them awake a little bit too right so they know you're going to ask them questions second thing with film never be in front always be behind them and have the group in front of you just little small things right so you can see who's watching film is an unbelievable tool for coaches to get their message across. Ted Hotelling is entering his 12th season as the head men's basketball coach at D2 University of New Haven. With 173 career victories, he stands second among nine head coaches in the history of the New Haven men's basketball program. Hotelling's teams have earned four bids to the NCAA Division II National Tournament, the most recent coming in 2022. Hotelling previously spent five seasons as an assistant at Eastern Kentucky University. Prior to arriving at Eastern Kentucky, he served four years as a full-time assistant at Yale from 2001 to 2005. Hotelling also served one season as an assistant at New Haven in 2000-2001. He began his coaching career at Adelphi University in 1998, where he spent one season as an assistant. In the fall of 2012, Ted was inducted into the University of Albany Great Dane Hall of Fame as both an individual student-athlete and as a member of the 93-94 men's basketball team that advanced to the NCAA Division III Elite Eight. After graduating from Albany, Ted went on to play professionally in Europe for the Cardiff Phoenix Basketball Club in Cardiff, Wales, and the Plymouth Rotoloke Raiders in Plymouth, England. Hey, hoop heads. I wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Coach Lionel Garrett from Wilberforce University, and you're listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast. Prepare like the pros with the all-new Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Fast Draw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoop Heads listeners 15% 15% off Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount, and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. If you're looking to improve your coaching, please consider joining the Hoopheads Mentorship Program. We believe that having a mentor is the best way to maximize your potential and become a transformational coach. By matching you up with one of our experienced mentors, you'll develop a one-on-one relationship that will help your coaching, your team, your program, and your mindset. The Hoopheads Mentorship Program delivers mentoring services to basketball coaches at all levels through our team of experienced head coaches. Find out more at hoopheadspod.com or shoot me an email directly. Mike at HoopHeadsPod.com. Follow us on social media at HoopHeadsPod on Twitter and Instagram. And be sure to check out the HoopHeads Podcast Network for more great basketball content. Coach, do you have a point guard or leader you're going to be counting on next season to run the show for you? Don't leave their success and your team's success to chance, or you may end up disappointed. Thousands of coaches send their players to a point guard college camp each year so they can discover how to think the game, lead your team, and run the show. They'll send them back to you a smarter player, a better leader, and better equipped to foster a championship culture next season in practice and in the locker room. You can go to pgcbasketball.com to find a camp near you. Take some notes as you listen to this episode with Ted Hotelling, men's basketball head coach at the University of New Haven.
Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel tonight. And we are pleased to be joined by Ted Hotaling, the head men's basketball coach at the University of New Haven. Ted, welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jason. It's uh, great to be here. I appreciate it. Excited to have you on. Looking forward to digging into all the things that you've been able to do throughout your coaching career. Let's start by going back in time to when you were a kid. Tell us a little bit about your first experiences with the game of basketball. Yeah, so I grew up in upstate New York in a small town called Niverville, New York. It's a uh, you know, really small town. Um, uh, mom and dad were both teachers, uh, youngest of three. My brother, I did whatever he did, obviously, growing up. So if he was playing soccer, I was playing soccer that day. If he was playing basketball, I would tag along as well. Uh, we were a huge sports family. My dad played three sports in college, played soccer, basketball, and baseball at Brockport State. And uh, my mom would have been a great athlete, I think, uh, you know, it was before Title IX. So luckily, my daughter doesn't have to deal with some of those things, right? But uh, dad coached at the high school level. So uh, soccer, varsity soccer, uh, modified basketball, and always was a part of Little League Baseball. So, I mean, I was at a practice every single day of my life. Uh, great, great childhood. And then, you know, I think eventually just morphed into this obsession with basketball. So I don't know how it happened. I just know I was just exposed to this. Uh, you know, exposed to the game at a really early age. My parents used to take us to basketball games and soccer games when we were kids. I'd go to see Albany and Potsdam. We'd go see Siena basketball. We'd go see RPI versus Union. So uh, we'd go see, you know, Catskill versus St. Pat's, which was two great high schools back in the uh, back in the 80s. So just always around the game. And obviously uh, my role models, you know, were essentially my dad and my brother. So, um, you know, got into it and it's been an obsession ever since. When you think about the influence of your dad as a coach and you look ahead to what you've done in your career and just the influence that your father's had on you, do one or two things about who he was as a person and as a coach stand out to you that are still continuing to play a role in what you do day in and day out? Yeah, I think so. You know, I just love being around them. I mean, you know, you talk about growing up the son of a coach. I mean, you're at practice every day or, you know, you're taking bus trips, you're driving in the car after wins and losses. My dad is just a really, really good person. I think first and foremost, I think he had a really positive effect on the people around him, especially his players. I know, you know, a lot of people will Facebook you and message you. And sometimes there's guys who reach out to me about their experience with my father. So just always, um, you know, Always loved being around him, loved being at his practices. And I, I saw the effect he had on young people, which I thought was really positive. He was very disciplined. Um, it was very demanding, but just always very, very likable and uh, really earned their respect just because of who he was more than anything else. And I think, um, you know, I don't know if I uh, have reached that as far as what my dad was. I'm, I'm certain I fall short, but uh, has always been a role model even to this day. He's just uh, really just a unique human being. His influence on you when you think about just that impact of being around somebody who day in, day out is having the kind of effect on people that even now are still reaching out to you and talking about, hey, your dad really had this tremendous part in my life when he was coaching me. And just to be able to be able to interact with him on a daily basis and then have you yourself eventually end up going into coaching. I'm sure that's something that when you have conversations with your dad, even today, do you guys sit down and kind of talk coaching? Obviously, you may not be talking X's and O's, but I know that there's there's probably conversations to be had when when the two and when the two of you get together or when you guys talk on the phone. Yeah, you know what? Not a lot of X's and O's. It's funny. We, uh, the human part of it, I think, is much more important to him. Um, and I, you know, I grew up in a house where sports were important, but it, it wasn't so much where there was so much pressure on their children to, to be a certain way. And I always respect that about my parents. And, um, you know, I think because of that, we have a relationship that goes beyond just sports as well, where we can talk about family, you know, talk about other things in our lives, like, you know, talk about experiences growing up that maybe don't have anything to do with sports. But um, yeah, we, we love talking about sports, right? So when we're around each other, we're talking about, you know, the Celtics and the Golden State or talking about the Yankees. So yeah, it's just, it, it's not any one thing. And I don't know if my dad's very humble. You know, it, it's funny, like I've had some experiences where I've been able to talk about him in public settings and, you know, he's really uncomfortable with that, which I always think is really cool um, because it's never really been about him. Um, so sometimes the conversations just, uh, you know, don't always lead to just basketball, which I think is pretty neat. 
How has that had an impact on how you've interacted with your own kids when you became a father and when you start thinking about your role as a sports parent and just how you've handled the situation with your own kids, thinking about how your dad handled it with you. I know you talked about him not putting pressure on you that, hey, you have to do this and him being a big part of just trying to put pressure on you to do certain things. So how has that influenced you as a parent? Yeah, you know, I've gotten to see, um, you know, when you're a coach, particularly at the college level, right, you can see how parents can affect their children either in a positive way or a negative way. I mean, I, I signed a kid named Jeff Atkins, who's been one of the best players at New Haven. I literally signed him because his father was awesome uh, interacting with him. And I just felt like, hey, that kid is probably going to be an extension of the dad. And you know what? That, that kid's probably a kid. It was one of my first recruiting classes at New Haven. It's probably someone that we, the type of person we want in our program. But for me, I don't want my relationship with my kids to only be about basketball. First of all, it's what I do every day. It takes me away from them, especially when they were little. Um, it is uh, an obsession, right? It's the old Bill Walsh when he's at a cocktail party drawing diagrams on his wife's back when he's not paying attention <laughs> much. Um, I often do the same things when you get lost in thought and you're living in the last game or living in the next practice. But I, I learned a long time ago that um, I don't want this to be anxious filled. I don't want this to be yucky for lack of a better word. I want it to be a positive experience for all of us. And I think my parents did that for me. Uh, they let me come to the game on my own terms. They let me fall in love with it. They encouraged it, right? They helped me along the way, but it wasn't overboard where I just didn't want to do it anymore. So, um, you know, my kids get in the car after practice or games, I literally just tell them, I love to watch you play. If they want to talk about it more, I do. If they don't, I'm, I'm pretty cool with that. So, you know, I want them to enjoy it more than anything. And then when they struggle, I want them to struggle. I want them to figure things out on their own. I think that's the other thing my parents allowed me to do was not solve every problem for me, right? Um, and I, I tell the parents that we recruit, hey, let your kid struggle. It's going to be the best thing for him. It'll be painful while he's going through it. It might be painful for you to watch it. But you know what? It's going to be the best thing for him. It's one of the lessons that he'll learn uh, going through this college experience as being a basketball player. So you know, I, I just think it should be, um, for lack of a better word, fun, right? It should be enjoyable. Um, basketball is just an amazing experience. It's all given me a ton of experiences. I'd love that for my children, but I do want them to find it on their own a little bit as well. When you think back to you as a player and the fact that, as you talked about growing up playing multiple sports and eventually you came to realize that basketball was the one that you wanted to focus on, how did you go about getting better and improving as a player when you were, let's say a high school player, what was your, what did your summers look like? How did you go about becoming a better player? Yeah. So it was, it's so different than it is now. I mean, you know, first of all, Niverville is not the Hamlet of ballers, right? It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty barren as far as it's basketball, um, you know, passion, so to speak. So, you know, I grew up in a very solitary um, world as far as basketball. I mean, my brother and I played one-on-one -on -one forever and he really beat me every single time we played until he went to college. And I think that really drove me. So when he went inside to eat dinner, I would stay out for another two hours to try and beat him. Um, my dad was very encouraging and helped me along the way. But I think, you know, nowadays kids are so, um, you know, there's so much exposure to how to become a better player. I think that was missing a little bit when I was growing up and you had to kind of figure it out on your own, right? Uh, ESPN had just started in 1979. So you know, you started to get a little bit of a, an idea of what a good player looked like when you're watching the Big East and when you're watching, you know, Big Ten basketball. But it was really, for me, growing up a solitary environment. I would literally ride my bike from outdoor court to outdoor court to outdoor court. I can still map it to this day, just trying to find someone to play with. If there was someone there, I would play him one-on-one. -on -one. If not, I would shoot for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, hop on my bike and go and go to the next playground. So, um, you know, we went to a few summer camps that were local at our local high school, and that was usually run by my dad. And then, you know, I think two things really happened for me. First thing is I went to the Oneonta State Point Guard Camp going into my junior year. It was run by a guy named Jeff Van Gundy, who was an assistant at Rutgers. And, you know, when you're growing up in a solitary environment playing hoops, you're kind of just, you know, trying to get it on your own. You really don't know what it's all about. I'll never forget, I was walking back from lunch with Coach and uh, – he said, you know, you'd be pretty good if you worked hard. <laughs> and I was totally shocked. I was like, <laughs> I do work hard. And he said, not hard enough. It's, oh, that has always stuck with me. I actually tell that story to some of our players. 
And then I saved up my money one year to go to five-star basketball camp. And I was exposed to, you know, other good players. And I think that kind of helped the process to, you know, figure out how to fine tune your game, like how to get a little bit more athletic, kind of get your speed and quickness up. Um, so, yeah, it was a long, long process for me. I was always a very late bloomer as well. Um, you know, transferred high schools after my sophomore year. So I hit the portal in 1989, <laughs> which is a lot earlier than most, and uh, got to play and uh, at LaSalle Institute with Joe Martelli in a city school, which I think really exposed me to another uh, realm of player and good players. So I just think every year I got a little bit more aware of what a good player was. And I think it just drove me to work more and more. But to be honest with you, it was, you know, it was my brother, my father, and a lot of it was just time put in by myself, you know, without AAU, without a lot of camps um, and without a lot of workout guys. It's so interesting to think about the difference between how, a kid grows up in the game today versus how you or I might've grown up back in the late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. It's just, it's completely different. Hearing you talk and mention five-star, we had some of the five-star guys come on and that are currently kind of taking care of the brand. And you think back to the time when that was just the, that was the camp, that was the place from both a player and a coach perspective, the number yes. of people that have come through that place. I mean, the list is, it's unbelievable. It's like the basketball hall of fame. Yes. And yet you look at it and you say, you tell a kid today, like if you were to go and talk to a top 50 player, talk, talk to any, talk to any high school player, say, yeah, the best, the very best players in the country, they used to fly into these, you know, whatever, yeah. whether you were going to Coriopolis or where, you know, Honesdale, wherever you, wherever you were, and you're playing on converted tennis courts and you're in the 95 degree <laughs> degrees and the sun's beating down on you all day. And then you get to stay out for, station 13 if you want to be a part of that and it i th i think they they would look at you like you had like four heads because yes. the idea of how kids play today versus that five star environment is just so different and i think and i'm sure you see this as a college coach when you're out recruiting just talking and, and working with your players that it, there's just a different way of development i don't know that one is necessarily better or worse than the other i always come at it from the perspective that i think today's players are much more skilled when you look at their skills in isolation they're way way better back in the day when you and i played the 11th or 12th player on a high school team probably was a player that didn't have a whole lot of skill maybe it was a 6-2 right. football player that just went out there to bang people around or that kind of player doesn't exist anymore because everyone's just so much more skilled and yet by the same token i feel like there's something that's been lost in the feel of the game because guys like you or i grew up playing against people of all different ages, different types of players in different environments. And I think there's something to be learned from that. So there's, there's good and bad to it. When you think about what your players bring to the table, having come up through the system that we have today, what are some of the strengths that you see that today's basketball system has given to the players that eventually end up playing college basketball and playing for you? Yeah, well, before I answer that, uh, so when I saved up my money to go to Five Star, I called the Five Star office. I bought the book. I don't know if you remember the Five Star book. Yes, the, yeah. Um, but the, in the, dr the drill, the drill book, the drill book. Absolutely, so I bought yeah. that book. I sent away for a brochure. I got it in the mail. I called the Five Star office, and Lee Klein answers the phone, and I said, "Mr. Klein, my name is Ted Hotelling, and I'm from Niverville, New York. In 1964, that's where Five Star started their camp." And he said, oh, my goodness, we started the madness in your town. So it's five star actually started in Niverville, New York in 1964, if you can believe that. But I had read the book, so I knew that, but uh, which I think is a pretty interesting story. Um, but regarding strengths, I think the shooting and I think this has to do with Steph Curry. Right. I think he really has changed the game in a, in a way that's really I don't even think we give him credit for. But I think the level of shooting from kids I mean, shooting off the dribble, off a jab step um, with range. I mean, I think that's just unbelievable now. Um, and there's so many resources and there's workout guys. I think dribbling, I mean, all the skills that, you know, go along with it, they're, they're all there with these kids now, right? And I think kids don't get bored with the workouts. I think they really like them. And I think they're engaging. I think, you know, you look at some of these guys who do a really good job of it, but, you know, keep it uh, fresh and new all the time. But, you know, they come in with good skill. When I was an assistant at Yale, I used to recruit California and I, another Jeff Van Gundy story. Right? I think Jeff Gundy is one of the best minds in basketball. I mean, he's just amazing to listen to and have, obviously have met him a few times along the way. And Steve Clifford, my first boss, actually worked for him for a long time. So 
I, I followed Jeff Van Gundy quite a bit. When I was at Yale, um, he did a talk at the pump camp. So I went from Dinos's camp and then traveled over to the pump camp to recruit. And I remember Jeff Van Gundy saying in 2001, his advice to kids was play less and drill more. <laughs> and now you look at it and my advice when I do camp camps and I, I go lecture, I'll say, hey, you need to play more and drill less. Yeah. And I do think that is the big part of it. And I think playing teaches you things that drills and skills can't, right? Competitive spirit, learn to play with others, you know, trying to stay on the floor and playing to your strengths. You just can't shoot any shot that you want. When it's time to win, you don't shoot a 25 footer, you get to the rim and get fouled. I mean, right. I mean, these are all the lessons that you learn on how to stay on the, on the court because you might sit for three or four more games. If there's a lot of people there, but you know, that would be my recommendation to kids now is to play more five on five, play more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but I do think the skill level has made the game better. And um, there are kids obviously who just have naturally a competitive spirit, but you know, understanding how to play, understanding who you are, who you're playing with, I think those things are, you know, probably need to be improved upon with the, with the next wave of kids coming through. It's always right. I think it's probably always been something. If you go back and think about when you and I were playing in high school or playing in college, there was probably always that same discussion amongst coaches, right? You want your players to have a higher basketball IQ. You want them to have a better feel for the game. And coaches have been trying to figure out how to develop that in players forever. And it's, vacillated back and forth in terms of how you do that. And obviously now we have the small sided games and, and being able to do and have the practices look more like the games or as much like a game as they possibly can to be able to help kids to get into decision making and just make those reads and do the things that you need to do out on the floor in order to be able to be successful both as as an individual and then take it a step further as a team. And so it's just interesting how player development and how coaching and what coaching actually means, how it's morphed and changed and, and over time into these different iterations that we have today. Think it back to you as a player. What do, you, what do you remember about your college experience? Just tell us a little bit about as a college basketball player, how you got to college first as a player, and then just what some of your experiences were like while you were there. Yeah, I mean, so one of the other things I tell parents and, you know, my son is ninth grade and my daughter's eighth grade. And I, you know, I interact with a lot of parents and some of them know I coach. So, you know, they'll ask me questions and I, I say the same thing. I say, you know, your kid is running his own race. Development is different for every young man and every young girl. Right. Um, and sometimes you grow quickly and sometimes you are more athletic, but everyone's running their own race. And the idea is not to panic is just let's let it develop and go. I was like really underdeveloped physically. I mean, I just couldn't gain weight. I was, you know, probably 150 pounds as a senior in high school. When I transferred from, you know, a very country school to a city school, I went to LaSalle Institute in Troy, New York. I averaged six points a game as a high school junior. And if anyone ever thought that I would even play in college, they were probably wrong. Now, I was obsessed and I worked really, really hard at it. And the following year, I became one of the better players in the Capital District and, you know, added, added a lot of points. And I got the attention of a lot of Division three schools. Funny story, Manhattan College came to watch us practice. And it's funny, like, I thought they would come to see me. And they, were, they actually, I, now I look back, they came to see Virgil Wallace, the big six, seven kid who ended up going to But I was dumb enough to think, hey, man, I think Manhattan. Right, they're here for me. us, right? Yeah. yeah, they're here for me. Absolutely. They were there for us. They were there for me. <laughs> so I was like, man, this is my time. Um, but I, I, funny story. So I ended up in college. I, I went to Doc Sowers High Five Basketball Camp. I think that's where Coach Sowers first saw me play. But I was – Mainly, I think because of my physical attributes um, and athleticism, a Division three player, but I, I had high IQ, I could shoot, and I was skilled. I was a coach's son. Um, so when I went to my college visits, I was all basketball. If you showed me anything else, I was not interested. <laughs> I really wasn't. Like, I didn't go to my prom, okay? I, and I, I didn't go to my prom. I was shooting baskets, and people were probably beeping at me as they were going to the, uh, going to the event. But I was on my dirt driveway shooting hoops on my spotlight. Um, so that was all it was about. I went and visited Albany on an unofficial visit. And Doc Sowers, who's a legendary coach, I mean, he's one of the best coaches in college basketball history. He literally sat down with me in the office. And the first thing he did was he brought out a scorebook and showed my dad had scored 20 points against Albany back in 1963, I believe, <laughs> which I thought was awesome. What a great recruiting pitch. And then Doc Sowers literally told me and my dad that I was going to play JV as a college freshman. Now, what would most kids do today? They would walk out the door and say, you know, how many minutes I'm going to get. My dad, to his credit, when we left there and said, you're going to go there. And my dad's whole thing was because you're going to play. That's the whole focus of this. 
you're going to get to play all the time on the freshman team, develop and become a good college player. It's the best thing for you. And whatever my dad told me, I was on board with. And I ended up at the University of Albany. Unbelievable decision for me. What a great experience. Uh, I take away unbelievable coaching, unbelievable relationships. Uh, Love my experience at the school and the people around that athletic department and professors and everyone. Um, I was from a place where there weren't a lot of people playing basketball. I thought I hit the a goal mark because every day in the gym there were people playing hoops, and you know sometimes I would skip class to, to play a couple extra pickup games. Um, but yeah, just an unbelievable experience, and um, really lifelong friends, and uh, learned a lot from Coach Sowers. Coach Sowers was um, such a great teacher of the game. I learned a ton. Um, he actually taught a basketball class. I still, I, it's funny. Like a month ago, I was just pouring through old notes, and I found my all my class uh papers for doc sour's basketball class <laughs> texted our backup point guard with you know took a screenshot and said man pouring through all my old tests with with coach sours um but yeah just i mean i look back on it fondly and i hope i can give the same experience to the guys in our program right because i think that's really part of the reason a big reason why i got into college coaching when you were thinking about what you wanted to do as a career obviously you go into college with the idea that Hey, it's all about basketball and I want to be a basketball player. Does that at some point during your college experience, do you start thinking about, Hey, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? What's, what's the plan here? And just how'd you go about figuring out what that was going to look like? And when did coaching kind of come on your radar? Yeah. So I was determined to be a pro. I really was. I mean, I, I did, I worked at it and I was able to play professionally for two years at a really low level. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't something I could do long-term, but I played for the, Plymouth Raiders and Plymouth England, and then the Cardiff Phoenix in uh, in Wales. Two great experiences, but um, I was I was going to be a teacher and a coach like my dad. I mean, that's that was my life growing up. I had an unbelievable childhood. I love my dad, love my mom. Thought they had built great lives for themselves and for their children, um, and I thought that was the way to go. I came home after my second year of playing, and I, I literally sat down in in our living room. And I remember my mom asking me this very question that you asked me. My mom and dad were in the room. And I said, well, I'm going to teach and coach like, like dad. And my mom says, why don't you try something else? And I said, why? You know, went through the whole you know, spiel. Hey, you guys have a great life. I want to coach. I think I can be a social studies teacher. I have a history degree. Uh, there's not much you can do with a history degree, let's be honest, other than probably teach at that point. Um, but my mom encouraged me to do something different. And um, so I went to graduate school at Delphi University. I tried like heck to get GA jobs. Uh, one of the guys that wrote back to me, a handwritten note was Jay Wright, who was at Hofstra. Uh, unfortunately, he told me he didn't have a position, but I, I ended up working uh, with a woman named Linda Gundrum at Adelphi in the uh, sports recreation department. I was miserable, and it wasn't because of her. It was because I was really missing basketball. Steve Clifford was the coach at Adelphi. On his staff was John Dunn, who's the head coach at Marist. Mike Longabardi, who is now an NBA assistant coach, has been really successful and he just didn't have enough space. And Freddie Grasso, uh, Jared Grasso's dad. And then the following year, I uh, I hopped on to my first college basketball experience with Steve Clifford. So, um, you know, I didn't fall into it, but it, it kind of found me. And once I got into it, it was like full speed ahead, man. This is this is the ultimate. And, and Steve Clifford had a lot to do with that. Had the ultimate respect for him. Loved going to practice every day. Loved learning from him. Um, amazing coach. Uh, really been an amazing impact on my life. And then met really good friends, obviously, who are still dear friends this day. So that's how I got into it, you know, um, ended playing and was looking for something to do with basketball. And luckily, I found uh, some people that love the same things I did. All right. Before we move to diving into your coaching career, give me your funniest, craziest European basketball story. Oh, my goodness. There's a lot of them. Well, first of all, <laughs> one time in, in, Car- in, in Plymouth, I literally I went for a shot fake. Right, I, I would yell at myself if I was the coach, but underneath the basket, I go for a shot fake and I literally land on my head and I'm sitting down on the parquet floor, which is as hard as concrete. And Gary Stronick, who is an awesome dude, he was our coach. He, I, I see him looking at me straight in the eye and he was a Geordie now. He had a Geordie accent, which is, you know, England up near Scotland, kind of a little further up than Newcastle. And I can remember him saying, mate, where are you, mate? And I was, and I was literally like, <laughs> England? And he goes, what's your name? I'm certain I had a concussion. I was sitting on the bench asking when I was going to go back in and went to the hospital later and 
I'm, I'm good enough. I practice the next day, but, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, in Cardiff, uh, we had, you know, I, I did pretty well. So I, I moved on to another club. They offered more money and about halfway through, they would give me my cash on Friday. So one night it's half the cash. So I went to the owner of the club and I said, uh, Hey, there's only my half my money here. And he's like, well, that's all we can afford right now. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> well, that's not what I signed up for. He said, well, you're going to have to talk to our sponsor. So I go to see the sponsor who owned like bars and restaurants in Cardiff, great city, by the way. And uh, he takes out a wad of cash and pays me what he owes me. And then continues to tell me that he's going to have a hostile takeover of the club and would like my support. <laughs> so I said, listen, I'm not into politics. I'm here to play ball. And he came to practice the following Thursday and tried to take over the club and told everybody in the room that after practice, if you want to be in the club, you have to meet me at this place tomorrow night and i supported the people that uh actually brought me there uh didn't help me financially but they actually had uh held on to the club didn't get paid a lot of money throughout the rest of the season but continued to play and then i thought you know what i probably should probably look to do uh get the coaching here pretty soon so that that is that essentially ended my career uh right there right then and there yeah cashing a paycheck in european basketball is always an adventure Let's put it, was, it, that way. it was uh you had to check you had to check every dollar that's for sure every pound i should say when you got that envelope on fridays after practice absolutely when you think back to that first experience coaching at adelphi and just what that was like for you what was something that was right from the get-go something that you loved about coaching like man this this little piece of it this part of it is something that i love right now from the moment it's probably something you still love yeah, I love being in the gym and I really did love like helping the players, you know, Chris, Chris Bernard, you know, Ryan McCormick, Ryan Lal, uh, Richie Edwards, uh, you know, uh, just a lot of really good kids who were really tough, competitive guys. And then I, I mean this, like Steve Clifford was amazing. Like I, I learned so much in that year. I, I really love that part of it, the, the learning aspect of it, but I learned more in that year and I was just like, you know, something lights a fire in you and it's something that you want to do. But, um, and then, you know, we ended up having a great year and, you know, one game from getting to the elite eight, which at Adelphi at the time, what Steve did there was pretty amazing. I think he had five scholarships at the time, like just an amazing coach, but, you know, being in the gym, you know, being connected to those players and trying to help them any way I could. And honestly, just being around Steve man. Steve is a, you know, I think, you know, there's coaches coach, right? He's a coach's coach, man. He's, he's in it for the right reasons. He loves the coaching. He loves the strategy, the tactics. He loves working with players. And, uh, you know, that was just an amazing experience. And um, honestly, just got a fire lit. And I burned the boats at that point, to be honest with you. So after one season at Adelphi, you get an opportunity at New Haven. Talk a little bit about how that came to pass. Well, before that, so Steve left Adelphi to go be an assistant at East Carolina. He, he wanted to get back in Division One, And, you know, I think he had some opportunities to be a Division One head coach. And I think they looked at the Division Two resume and, and weren't impressed for whatever reason, um, I think, to some of the school's detriment. Um, but James Jones had gotten the head coaching job at Yale. And Steve told me, you're going to volunteer at Yale because, you know, even now the third assistant at the Ivy League is not paid. So um, I... James was my assistant coach at Albany. Uh, Steve helped hook it up. I talked to James, obviously, and I, I moved to New Haven, Connecticut and volunteered um, and worked in a great staff. And, and again, had a great op opportunity to learn from someone who's really been outstanding in his uh, professional life here. James has really crushed it at Yale. So, and then the following year, got hired by Jay Young for $15,000, man. It's pretty cool. So didn't have it, didn't have health insurance. And I was still playing ball at night, a couple nights a week, but um, you know, got to work with Jay Young. As he you, don't need, you don't need health insurance when you're 25. Who are you kidding? Yeah, I was 26 <laughs> at the time. So I don't even think my parents covered it. So, um, yeah, it, it's funny what you do now. And when you get older, you're like, oh, my God, what was I doing? But I was right. playing in, I was playing in men's leagues at the sure. time and down in New Haven and, you know, coaching ball. And, you know, I didn't have any money. So I was staying in the office till 10 at night because that's, that's, you know, otherwise I was going to spend money. And, um, yeah, so and then. I remember having this conversation with Jay in the spring after that year at New Haven. I was living on my credit card. I was, you know, uh, going to the grocery store, putting stuff on my credit card. And I was living pretty low rent in a really tough section. And uh, I remember telling him, like, I have one more year. I have to make money or else I probably can't do this. And then two weeks later, you know, James called and, and offered me the full-time job back at Yale, which was, uh, which is pretty cool. I was 
27, 28 years old when I got my first check to uh, to be a college coach. What was unique about working in that Ivy League environment? Uh, yeah, really unique people. So, um, you know, I still, and I think it's funny, I, you, know, you have a different relationship when you're an assistant than when you're a head coach. You know, I have great relationships with all those guys that were at Yale that, that we coached. They were just awesome people. Uh, I organized a run with the dads on like Saturday mornings to play like pick up five on five, four on four, which those guys were awesome. But um, high level people, um, the way you coach them is very different, I think, than I've, I've coached other places. Um, you know, the, you have to explain things to them. There's got to be a why. They're very inquisitive. They're very smart. And I think that really taught me at that point, like, you know, you better really know your stuff. You better be really organized and detailed. And you better have a why and you better be able to explain that why for them to really grasp it and then believe in you. Because I think that's really ultimately what players want. Um, and then just the Friday, Saturday dynamic, um, playing Penn and Princeton when they were in their heyday. Fran Dunphy was, man, what an unbelievable coach. Um, Bill Carr, was at Princeton at the time. That was my first real venture into Princeton offense. And I really, um, you know, just was consumed with it. Um, and at that time, Armand Hill was at Columbia and Dave Foucher, who was a great coach, was at Dartmouth. They all ran Princeton offense. So, you know, just a ton of great experiences there, um, just at Yale and then in that league, just really well coached league and honestly helped me grow as a coach and develop um, as a recruiter because I got to recruit nationally. And then from there, you go to Eastern Kentucky. Tell us a little bit about what you did there at Eastern Kentucky and what you what you learned over the course of this time that you had as an assistant coach, just the things that you've taken with you now as you become a head coach. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think I worked for three defensive oriented guys. You know, Steve was a very defensive oriented guy and very balanced in his approach, but like really great on the defensive end. Jay Young, who's the head coach of Fairfield now is, you know, if people want to learn great defense, he's an excellent defensive coach. And really James, uh, really before he started was a defensive coach. You know, I got offered the job by Jeff Newbar like 10 o'clock on a Monday night. I was sitting in my living with my fiance and I told her, I was like, I just got offered a job at Eastern Kentucky with the new head coach who worked for John Beeline uh, at West Virginia. And I said, uh, we have to go take a look. And so we flew down on that Friday and um, I committed to come work for him. I think, you know, that next morning. And really, I, I really wanted to be a better offensive coach. I think I had a good base. I think I learned a lot from the Princeton offense. I really wanted to dive into two guard. Jeff was an outstanding offensive coach, uh, very detailed, really high level, second level thinker. Um, and then the other thing too, is just really organized. So different region for me, uh, which was a uh, very unique and great experience. Um, but yeah, I learned a lot from Jeff, my time at EKU. I had great assistance there. I know you've had Jeff and Josh Merkel on the staff, man. He's you know national championship coach. He was on staff there. Everett Sullivan, Unbelievable player at Louisville, great coach at Vincennes. He's now the head coach at Lenore Ryan. I think Peter Thomas just got the job at Richmond. I mean, we had Dale Wellman won a national championship, Nebraska Wesleyan, you know, guys like David Boyden. I mean, we had really, really good coaches. High school coach Ben Fratrick was down in Orlando, went to the state finals this year. I mean, just look at the people that you're around. Just a great learning environment. And um, thought I just became a better offensive coach, to be honest with you. And um Dove two feet in, and you know we run the same stuff at East at uh, New Haven now that we did at East Kentucky. Obviously, with different personnel and some different looks, but um, I think it just helped me become a more balanced coach uh, as far as offense and defense. Your first impression is everything when applying for a new coaching job. A professional coaching portfolio is the tool that highlights your coaching achievements and philosophies, and most of all, helps separate you and your abilities from the other applicants. The Coaching Portfolio Guide is an instructional membership-based website that helps you develop a personalized portfolio. Each section of the Portfolio Guide provides detailed instructions on how to organize your portfolio in a professional manner. The guide also provides sample documents for each section of your portfolio that you can copy, modify, and add to your personal portfolio. As a Hoopheads Pod listener, you can get your Coaching Portfolio Guide for just $25. Visit coachingportfolioguide.com slash hoop heads to learn more. The opportunity at New Haven to take over a program as the head coach. You've been at the Division One level at Eastern Kentucky and Yale for a number of years at that point. So now you're going to switch gears and go to Division Two. Just tell me a little bit about your thought process 
when that job comes open and just what the what, what it looked like getting the job in terms of the interview and just your conversations that you had with your wife and just making the decision that, Hey, this is the right place for me. Obviously you had been there before for a season. So you had some familiarity, which I'm sure played a role in it, but just talk a little bit about how you went about getting that job and what, what that process looked like. So funny story, you know, they, they were interested in talking to me about the head coaching job five years prior before, right after I took the EKU assistant job. And I just politely declined because I had just taken Eastern Kentucky you know, I committed to moving there and, and helping uh, Jeff, you know, help help the program. So there was some familiarity. I tell young coaches this all the time, and I can't impress upon the small people enough. Wherever you are, you're interviewing for that job, right? And when I was at New Haven as an assistant, I didn't have a lot of money in my pocket. But you know what? I dressed up every day. I act in a professional way every day. I tried to treat people the right way every day. Um, I tried to handle things professionally every day. And I worked really, really hard. And I think that had, you know, some impact on me getting hired by W. Chen back in 2010. When the job did open up, honestly, it was, you know, I think it was my job to lose. So they did bring me an interview. Um, you know, it was a very familiar interview. I think that helped. I knew the place. I think that helped as well. I mean, you kind of know the keys to, you know, what's going to win there. Um, how are you going to operate there? How are you going to work with administration there? And I think that's the biggest thing is just, you know, understanding the place, understanding what the athletic director and what, what she wanted in a head coach uh, really helped me uh, come back and get the job. I wanted to be a head coach. I was desperate to be a head coach. I was 36 at the time, and I just wanted to be a head coach, man. Um, that was my goal getting into this. I don't really care about level. I'll be honest with you. I never have. Um, I, I say that to players as well, right? You know, I played with a kid named Jason Graber. I don't say that Jason Graber is a great Division Three player. I say he's a great player. Ryan McCormick was Division Two player of the year. Ryan McCormick was a great player. Um, so I, I just think that there's this, um, you know, this idea, especially in college athletics, where if it's not Division One, it's not as good. And I, I really would 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 uh, would would bust that myth wide open and say, every level where there's opportunity, it's great room for growth to learn and develop. And that was for me. Uh, the most important part. So, um, yeah, and it's um, just been a great experience, you know, and, um, you know, I think my personality is such that, um, you know, I want to be a head coach. And that was uh, really the the whole idea behind it. And my wife, who's from Connecticut, was on board with it and, um, you know, brought our two kids back home. They were born in Kentucky and brought her back a little closer to home where they could see their grandparents. And, uh, you know, I could be a head coach. What were the strengths and weaknesses of the program coming in as you looked at it? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I'd say this in recruiting too, right? Like when you're recruiting kids, you want to know what they're good at, and what they're bad at, and then you have to accept what they're not good at and be okay with that and then play to their strengths. So the strengths of the University of New Haven were my knowledge of what the place was about, what kind of kid could do well there, and my familiarity with administration, some of the other coaches, and just a comfort level where, hey, I'm a good fit here. Um, some of the drawbacks were um, they hadn't done well for the previous five years. And, um, you know, they, it was kind of limping into the Northeast 10. They went from the ECC to the Northeast 10. Um, uh, I think my first year was their second year in the NE 10, which is a really good league. Um, it wasn't funded as much scholarship wise as some of the other ones. And there were some challenges with facilities. But, um, you know, I, and I think this for most people, and I include myself in this, you know, the job chooses you. and you have a choice. You, you take on that challenge and you do the best you can with what you have with where you are, or you can wait around and try and find something else. I wasn't scared of the job. I was very confident that I could do well. And honestly, I kind of liked the fact that it was a tough job at the time because I actually enjoy that, that part of it. Um, and I know uh, some people think differently. They want the Kansas job right away. <laughs> but for the majority of us, you know, the challenge is to win at hard jobs. And um, I was excited to take on that challenge. All right. So what did you do during the time when you were an assistant? So earlier in your career, what were you doing to prepare yourself to be a head coach? And then to go along with that, take it one more step. What advice would you have for somebody who's a young assistant coach that eventually has in their mind, just like you did, that they want to take over a program? What advice would you have somebody who's in that position? So kind of what did you do 
to prepare? And then what advice would you have for somebody who is at that same point in their career? Yeah. So, so Steve Clifford, I mean, we used to sit in the office sometimes and he would talk and I would listen. I mean, I would just soak it up, you know, and I know I'm talking about Steve a lot, but even when I talk to Steve on the phone now, I have a notebook and I take notes and I put them in my Evernote and I constantly reflect on ball screen coverage or some of the stuff he does with leadership. So, you know, he's been really important for my career. And um, I remember sitting in the office one day and we were talking about philosophy. And he said, if you don't write it down, then you don't have one. And I really took that to heart. And I immediately began to write down every single thing that I could about basketball. And at the time, in 98, 99, it wasn't very much. It was just whatever I learned from Steve and whatever I knew from Doc Sowers. I didn't really have a big network. I was still trying to find my way. I was not a Division One player. I was a, you know, a good Division Three. My, my knowledge was very limited, but I wrote notes all the time, um, everywhere, in on pads of legal paper, on marble notebooks, and on practice plans. And I just began to formulate my my plan. And it was very primitive to start. And then I was recruiting at Yale, and I, I got. Uh, Bill Walsh's book, Finding the Winning Edge, which I recommend for anyone. I know it's really expensive, um, but it's honestly, I think, the greatest coaching book ever written. There's a lot of them, but that, that's the best one. I read that book on a recruiting trip to California, cover to cover. I skipped some of the offensive lineman chapters and some of the free agency chapters. But I remember thinking to myself, man, this guy is so organized and so detailed that I am so far away that I need to be better. So I, I mean, my book now is about 325 pages. And what I put in that book was everything I learned from every coach uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. It was the most mundane things of how would I practice after we won? How would I practice after we lost? Uh, what would our first meeting look like? What would our first summer school meeting look like? Um, you know, every single thing you can think of, what would our pregame itinerary look like as far as before we get to the floor? Um, you know, what would a travel itinerary look like? Uh, what does our first practice look like? These are the, you know, I, I mean, every single thing you can think of, I just really just constantly just was writing things down and putting it on paper. And I think the more you write things down, the more it becomes who you are, the more you can talk about it, the more you can teach it, and the more you can be it. So that, that would be my first advice is, you know, the skill of writing things down is incredible. I'd also say read as much as you possibly can. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about basketball. It can be, you know, Pete Drucker on how to work an organization. If you look at Bill Walsh's career, he was probably more, you know, he was impacted by Paul Brown, who's the, the father of modern football. But he's also a huge Pete Drucker reader and a Warren Bennis reader, right? He tied all these things into his coaching philosophy. I would say that everything you do can be tied into a coaching philosophy. And I think you should use that to your advantage. Um, and there's so many resources out there to help you. And don't just limit yourself to basketball coaches. There's great football coaches, great baseball coaches. And you might spur an idea to lead you to something else. And then, you know, when you get your job, you better be ready. It's, it's a lot, right? And um, you don't have time to, to write down your first workout. You probably need it in your hands because you need to go recruit, right? You don't have time to develop a philosophy how to deal with your AD because you're going to have to go recruit. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, you just have to have things ready, right? And if you're going to sit down and think about it when you get the job, in my opinion, it's too late, unless you have the Kansas job, right? And I don't mean to belittle the Kansas job, but, you know, some jobs, you're going to be able to get high talent level and overcome some of those things. But, you know, if you want to be absolutely ready, my advice would be to read and write things down and, and put it in a way where you can understand it and, you know, you can have a real tangible written document that can serve as your philosophy and you can refer to all the time. So obviously going through that process of putting your philosophy on paper and trying to think through scenarios, situations, things that you're going to have to deal with as a head coach, you come into that position about as prepared probably as you possibly could be without ever having been a head coach before. But I'm sure that there was probably one or two things that maybe you didn't think about or maybe that were something that surprised you about being a head coach. So when you think back to that first, whenever 60 days on the job or that first season or two, is there anything that fits that description that was surprising or maybe just you didn't realize, hey, the head coach has to do this or that or, or more of this and that than I thought? 
Yeah, you know, you don't know what you don't know either, right? And you're trying to observe, you're trying to ask questions. You know, the other thing I would add for for young coaches is to have a group of five to six people that you can count on and call and lean on, right? Your own board of trustees, so to speak. And I, you know, I had developed that along the way where if I did encounter situations at New Haven that I wasn't prepared for, you know, I could pick up the phone and they would listen, give advice, and I could call you know, Mike Longabardi and Jay Young and John Dunn and, you know, Steve and people like, and James and people like that to help. I think the biggest thing is, you know, you don't know what support is until you're actually a head coach, right? And I think that's the biggest thing is, is really um, aligning yourself with your athletic director um, and aligning yourself with the mission of the university. And I think that's the one thing as an assistant that you don't often get to experience. You don't get to experience, you're not in those meetings, you're not privy to those conversations, I would I would probably recommend to assistant coaches to sit down with your head coach sometime and be like, hey, when you sit down with the AD, what do you talk about? Hey, what are some of the challenges that you deal with when you're talking with your AD, right? Um, the other part is, um, you know, managing a staff. And, you know, I, I've been treated really, really well, and I try to treat my staff really well. Um, but, you know, we're going to get young people at the um, Division II level. You're not going to get seasoned veterans because of the pay grade. And I think, you know, spending more time with your assistant coaches to get them on the same page. I've gotten infinitely better at that as we've gotten gone along. Um, I was lucky to hire a guy named Toby Carberry. Um, I'm going to give another good advice to young coaches. So I interviewed a lot of people. First, so when I first got the job, I interviewed like 20 people because I wanted to practice interviewing. And um, I brought uh, at least 10 to 12 to campus. And I thought I would become a better interviewer and be better at the job if I could get those reps in. Cause I hadn't had those reps. And that's the other thing I think I wasn't totally prepared for. I brought Toby Carberry and he was at another school and they'd won two games in back-to-back years. I tried to get Toby Carberry to say the most anything negative about the head coach that he worked for or about the place. And man, that guy didn't say one negative thing. And I hired him. I mean, that's the guy I hired. And I would say to a young assistant coaches, like when you do interview for jobs, It doesn't benefit you at all to speak negatively about your boss, about your school, about your situation, about anything that went on in your last stop. Like take the high road. People are aware of where you're coming from. They want people who are positive and they want people to um, not be a blame, complain, defend guy. Right. And I think we're always trying to avoid those people in the hiring process. So I would say those two things is, you know, just getting acclimated to the dialogue you have with your AD and getting on the same page and being in alignment. And then also the hiring process, because you don't really go through it very often as an assistant and trying to get the right people on staff that you can align with and, uh, and hit the ground running. That's a great point about not bringing up negative things from past stops in an interview. I think it's something that when you stop and think about it, it makes sense. But I'm not sure that going into it, especially young coaches, understand how that can make you come off in an interview. So I think it's really a good piece of advice and it's something that you could take in your own life. I know I'm always talking with my kids and looking for opportunities to point out to them about optimism and kindness and, and looking looking on the bright side of things. I think that's a really good example of that, that yeah. look, if you're going to bring somebody in on your staff, you don't want somebody, look, if they're complaining and grumbling about where they were in the past, <laughs> there's a pretty good chance that they're probably going to spend at least a bit, a little bit of their time grumbling and complaining about where they are. Yep. And we all know the job's hard enough as it is that if you have somebody who's going to be grumbling about how difficult it is or this or that, then not a whole lot's going to get done. And you got to look for people who want to find solutions as opposed to people who are looking for problems. And I think that's a great, yep. great piece of advice that you just shared. Yeah. You know, it's um, we call it our program BCD, right? No BC, no blame, complain, defend. Uh, I use it with my kids, you know, um, you know, it doesn't really solve any issues, right? And you always know the people that um, you're trying to avoid because those are the people that always BCD, right? They're always blaming somebody else. They're always complaining about their circumstances or they're always trying to defend their own actions or their own production, right? If it's if it's not going well. So, you know, you're trying to avoid those people on your staff. You're trying to avoid those players in your program. And you're trying to avoid doing that in your own life as well, right? To be a good example for the people around you. Absolutely. Now, you've talked a couple of times about recruiting and now we're talking about it in the confines of this particular conversation and the type of players that you're looking to bring in. So tell us a little bit about the recruiting process. How do you come up with your initial list of recruits? Where does that list come from? 
I'm assuming it's through contacts that you have with AAU high school coaches, but just give us, how do you get that initial list? And then once you have that initial list, what's the process that you go through to pare it down and how do you zero in on the guys that you really want to bring on campus and that you hope can become a part of your program? Yeah. So, I mean, you, you generate names a lot of different ways. And, um, you know, I think when you're on a smaller staff, you have, have to really find a way to like pinpoint the guys that you really want. And I think what we do at New Haven is we don't really mass recruit. We try and find guys that we really like. We zero in on those guys because I think we're pretty aware of the fit and their level and evaluate them in the right way, in a realistic way and not, um, you know, I'm not going to recruit a five-star prospect, right? So um, I think the best way to recruit is to watch. And when you go recruiting, don't talk the whole time, actually watch the games and evaluate. And I think you have to watch prospect more than once. I think with film now, it gives you an unbelievable opportunity to watch more film before you go see people live in the summer or during the year. Um, you know, we generate names from recruiting lists and from guys that we trust. Um, you know, when you're in this industry long enough, you get friends, right? It's good to have connections because um, young assistants who I try and befriend a lot, you know, try and help them a lot. You know, a lot of times they'll call me with a kid that's maybe not good enough for them, but might be good for us or it doesn't fit them and is a good fit for us. And then the process really is, um, you know, you have to have a system. I, I am a systems uh, person. I think you have to have uh, systems to help you from making mistakes. And, you know, I tell the story all the time. I, I went to a, a coaching um, uh, retreat and Tim Kite, who's really, really, really good with leadership. I was in the front row and he says to me, you know, in front of all these coaches, mostly football coaches, he says, coach, do you have a offensive system? And I said, yes. Do you have a defensive system? And I said, yes. Do you have a leadership system? And I said, no. And I kind of took that as, you know what? I need to systematize um, everything that we do. So when we do get new assistants, we can be on the same page. And this is what a New Haven basketball player looks like. So uh, in 2000. 16, in 2015, 16, we had a really bad year. And um, it really was because I made poor choices in recruiting. It was a great year for me. You know, our job at New Haven, I always thought was to minimize our down cycles, kind of like the Oakland A's, right? Like we're not the New York Yankees. We don't have the most resources, the best facilities. So I took the Oakland A's model and said, you know, we're going to minimize our down cycles and 15 wins is going to be a bad year at New Haven. And we're going to eventually get to NCAA tournament appearances. And we had eight wins in that year, and I had a bunch of suspensions. I, I just didn't do a good job recruiting. I revamped our entire recruiting philosophy. Number one, you have to be academic in order to come to school here. You have to pour over their transcripts. You have to look at what they're good at, what they're bad at. We like kids who have high GPA and maybe low test scores and not vice versa, right? And it just means they're not trying as hard. We like kids who have shown improvement over four years, right? We like kids that just care about the academic side of it. And we like when their parents come to campus and they – uh, also talk about the academic side of it. Want well, kids with good character. Obviously, that's going to be an exhaustive process to really um, narrow in on the kid, talk to their guidance counselor, talk to other people that know them. And that's not a perfect science, but you're trying to do the best you can. And then we want people that absolutely love and live basketball because I think that's the main component of it because you're going to have bad days in college, right? And how much enthusiasm do you have to come back after two bad days or not playing at all? Is that really a part of who you are? Do you identify as a basketball player? And if you don't do well in the other two things, I can take those, I can take basketball away and, and it hurts. Um, and then we systematize just what we look for in players and we look for stars, spatial awareness. Um, some of the things there are steal percentage. If you look at the NBA now, you know, steal percentage is a great indicator of IQ, right? It's instincts, it's anticipation. Um, and I know um, NBA guys really look at that at the college level. You know, some teams play zone, so it's not obviously as easy. So if you're evaluating Syracuse, it might not be as easy to evaluate that. But we're just trying to evaluate spatial awareness. And sometimes when you see it, you know, like kids know where the ball should go. We're like tough kids, mainly for us, that's just being resilient and being coachable. Mm -hmm. Athletic enough. You don't have to be super freak, right? You can just be athletic enough to compete at the level you're at. We have to have range shooting unless you're a five man. And I would think that, you know, we do love guys who are unselfish. So, you know, that's kind of how we grade our guys and how we use our system. And it's not fail safe, but I think really what it, tell, it helps us avoid mistakes. I tell my assistants all the time, there's three rules, just like Warren Buffett, right? There's three rules in investing. Don't lose money. Don't lose money. Don't lose money. You're just trying to minimize your mistakes that you make with people. And the more information you have, the better. And if you have a good kid that needs to develop, we can deal with that. 
but sometimes like taking the wrong people can really, really affect your program. And we've learned the hard way. And I think we've done a better job of that um, over the last few years. AAU versus high school in terms of your evaluation process, do you prefer one or the other? I know obviously you're going to use both and see both, but do you look for different things when you're watching a kid in the different environments and maybe how do you balance out how much is it 60% their high school career, 40% their AAU career? I don't know if you can even put a percentage on it, but just talk about the difference between what you're looking for or what you watch when you're watching an AAU game versus a high school game. Yeah, so I think our process in Division Two probably start, starts a little later than Division One. So we're going to find most of our guys in the summer, right? It's going to be, you know, one camp season was really at, at its height with the hoop group and, you know, with AAU seasons. So we're going to find guys in AAU. And I, I, I love AAU. I, I think it's awesome. I know it gets a bad name for, um, you know, maybe some bad actors or whatever it might be. But I actually think it's there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work at that level and respect the fact that there's a lot of people doing a lot of great things and helping kids get exposure to college coaches. So, um, you know, you also can find out when you when you show up on Sunday morning at 8 a.m. who really loves to play, right? I mean, those are things that you don't often see with your high school team. You find out pretty quickly who can compete against other athletes or who can fit in. You know, high school is a, the next level for us where you go now watch them with their high school team. And then more often than not, that kid's going to be the best player on his high school team. And how does he approach his teammates? Like, um, what kind of role does he have as the star, whether maybe he was a role player in AAU? So, I mean, you're trying to take it all into um, view and you're trying to do the best thing, best way you can is just to, hey, who is this player and how's he going to fit with us? But I think both are very important. But for us, it really does start with AAU, to be honest with you. And then once you get an idea of, you know, is that kid a recruitable player, you, you start to delve into the high school ranks. Once you get a kid on campus and you're ready to start putting them into your team and you're talking about practice, you're talking about the design of practice. Let's dive into a little bit of what you do when you are putting together a practice plan. Do you have sort of a set formula that you go by? Do you look at the previous day's practices? How do you go about designing a practice so that you can get the maximum amount of benefit in the time frame that you have in order to get the most out of your players? Yeah, so we have the luxury of uh, individuals. I mean, our individuals start, it's day one every year. I mean, you know, we are pass and catch footwork. Uh, you know, I think the most important part in an offensive system is how you catch the ball, how you pass the ball, and then your pivots, to be honest with you. I think controlling the ball and controlling turnovers is huge. I mean, we'll pass back and forth for eight minutes for the first two weeks, at least every individual. And then we're just trying to get a baseline for where guys are at. You know, a lot of stationary shooting, a lot of dribbling drills. And I think the job of a coach is to notice, right? And I think early in, in most people's 10 years, mine included, you want to talk a lot and you want to coach a lot. And I've talked a lot less um, as I've gotten older and, and I've gotten, you know, more, more experience being head coach. You're just trying to notice. And then when we build our practice, you know, we have, you know, we're building our base and our first two practice will look identical and um, we're not going to change it from October 15th to October 16th. After those first two practices, and we'll get them on film and I will watch, you know, practice film, you know, throughout the day, every day. Um, then we're going to really go by what we see on film. Um, the way I watch the film is I, I cut my legal pad in half and on the left is offense, on the right is defense. You know, red ink is personnel. So if I want to help Eric Anderson in the post, I can write in red ink, EA. Hey, let's work on some left block. And this is what he's doing wrong, like high release on his hook. So you're trying to make him a better player while you're trying to make the team better as well. And then all I do is I pull the ideas out what I see on film and put it into the practice plan. If I pull it off the legal pad, I highlight it in yellow to know that I put it in practice. So there'll be some things that I didn't put in practice that day, and I might have to go look at that again the next day. But really what we're trying to do is become experts on our players and maximize their strengths. And we're trying to become experts on our team, meaning who are we going to play, where the playing group's going to be, and what can we be good at. So, And I think that's just an ongoing process in the preseason. So, um, And it's different for every team. Now, we're, we're pretty set in how we're going to play. We're going to play man-to-man, -man and we're going to run two-guard. Um, but you know what we do out of two-guard and – and how we highlight and how we highlight those players is probably going to come from, from practice film majority, majority of the time. Just give us an idea of how much time you spend watching the practice film and breaking it down. Because I know that 
various coaches have different philosophies on how much they watch of their own team versus how much they watch of opponents once you get into your season and your schedule. But I know that practice film is important to you. So just talk about sort of its role in your preparation and how you get your team to the point where you want them to be so that they're prepared game in and game out to be at their best. Yeah. So, I mean, I watch practice film all day. I think that's my, my main, my main job during the season is to make our team better. Right. And I think that's the best way to do it. I think watching practice film also allows you to see patterns and allows you to kind of connect dots so you can become an expert on your team. And if you can't see things, my advice to most coaches would be, well, just go watch it again. If you can't see things, go watch, just keep watching it until you can figure things out. Um, So yeah, it's, you know, the first thing I do is as I watch the first, I clip every possession of practice and that's the first viewing. And then I'll go back and I'll start labeling some of the things that I like. The primary things I'm looking for, particularly early in the season is, I'm always gonna show every turnover that we have in live action. I'm always going to show, you know, um, coverage, you know, ball screen coverage, uh, positives and negatives. Uh, we're going to show some guys individual film. Hey, you're not running hard enough. This is what it looks like. Um, and then we're going to show transition defense, right? I mean, there's there's things that I think we all hold dear to our heart. Um, and that's what we're going to watch majority of the time. Once I, uh, once I label those clips, I then go pull clips out that I want to show. And then I group them into, you know, how I want to show them. 19 clips or less only for the team. And uh, Gordy Chiesa, the great assistant coach for the Utah Jazz, who's really, he'd be a great guest on your show, by the way. Unbelievable stories and just a fountain of knowledge. But um, I asked him one time how many clips they watched with the Utah Jazz. Because at one point, early in my tenure, I was watching 25, 35. I mean, I was I was wearing dudes out. And it was long <laughs> film sessions. And we, were, and we were a good team, so I thought it was working. Um, but he said 19 or less. And I took that to heart because I do think kids' uh, attention span is less. I don't want to wear them out mentally by the end of the year where they just don't have anything left mentally to give, right? I want them to be sharp. Um, so then, and, I, and then to be honest with you, I rehearse what I'm going to say with those clips. I mean, I take it to that extent where, you know, before I bring it to the team, I'm going to take notes. I'm going to write one through 19 on my pad. I want to write exactly what the clip is, what I want to teach them, and what I want them to learn from it. So, I mean, I do go to that extent, um, and I think it's pretty important because I do think, you know, the one thing that your kids want to see is that you're organized and you're detailed and that you're an expert on your subject matter. And the only way to do that is to show them that every single day. And I think that's my way of showing them that I care and my way of showing them like, hey, I am working as hard as I can to help you become better. And I know exactly what we want to do, what it's going to look like. And I'm going to show you on film exactly um, how it looks or how it should look. That's a great point. And that's a great piece of advice for any coach, but specifically young coaches is if you're going to come out and you're going to demonstrate a drill or you're going to share something on film, or you're going to put together a play that you want your players to run, you better make sure that you know exactly what you're talking about and exactly what you're saying. I know that I've been in a position where as a high school coach, as an assistant that our head coach put something in, we got his own offense and maybe the, head coach has to step out for 10 minutes and man, if I didn't know exactly what I was supposed to be doing and showing, and we're supposed to be going over zone offense while coach steps out for, to take a phone call or talk to an athletic director or whatever, your credibility can go really, really fast with your players. And so I think that that's a great, great point that you make. I think it's one that sometimes we overlook because everybody says, ah, you know, you work hard and you got to know what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. That's great. But when you think about the amount of knowledge that goes into knowing everything that, just as an example, your head coach knows sometimes as an assistant, you kind of take it for granted. Well, that's really not my area of expertise. Somebody else can know that. Well, no, there may be a time when a player has a question for you, or maybe there's a time where you do have to run the drill or whatever it might be. And if you don't have the knowledge to be able to do that, it definitely can quickly cut into your credibility. Yeah. Going back, going yeah. back to going back to the film piece of it, when you're showing those 19 clips or less to your team, Do you think about the balance between showing them things that they've done wrong that you want them to correct and showing them things that they've done right that you want them to continue to do? Does it just kind of vary based on the film of that given day or do you try to have a particular balance day in and day out? Yeah, I mean, it's very intentional was what I would say. And, um, you know, I think there's an ebb and flow to your season, right? Like, you know, hey, the first 10 days of preseason, it's hard. 
and the clips let them know, hey, we're not even remotely close to where we're at, right? As you get towards the season, it might be more positive. I think I think you need to be very intentional with film, and I hope our players aren't listening right now. I mean, I'll go so far as to establish who's going to play in that film session, right? So if I want to advance, if I want to say, hey, Johnny's going to play into our staff, I'm going to show five positive clips and say, hey, this is why Johnny's going to play. Look at him dive on the floor. Look what Johnny did here. Steve Clifford was amazing at that, at giving, uh, allowing the team to see what he sees, right? Whether it was, and he was more on the floor at that time because it was less, you know, less capabilities with video and and, uh, and computers. But really, I'm trying to tell our team exactly why certain guys are going to play. I'm also going to use clips for guys who think they should and probably point out some things why they're not doing and in a public way and not to demean them, but just to kind of send a message of, hey, this is not good enough. If you're not playing, I'm, I'm showing you the reasons why. Um, and it's subtle, but you have to be very intentional with film. And I think that, um, you know, it, it can't be messy. It can't just be thrown together. You know, you got to spend a lot of time to do this. And I think whatever you're trying to get out of it, and there's a lot of things you can want to get out of it, it's always contextual, um, but there's always a purpose to it, right? So what you're saying is positive clips. So if if one of my players is struggling, I'm going to show him making a clip, right? Hey, look at Devontae Thomas here, man. Look at that three. Devontae, shoot it every time you touch it. Your light is so green, it's blue, man. Like, we want you shooting all the time. You're a great shooter, right? He might need that that particular day. We might have another kid shooting too much, and I might say, hey, who thinks this is a good shot? All right, you might be the only one in the program that thinks it's a good shot. Tell us why it's not a good <laughs> shot. I also think with film, you want them to answer questions. So instead of me telling them everything and, you know, uh, you know, you know, kind of like uh, the voiceover of a documentary, you have to ask them what they see. I think that's how learning really uh, helps them. And it also keeps them awake a little bit too, right? So they know you're going to ask them questions. Second thing with film, never be in front. Always be behind them and have the group in front of you. Just little small things, right? So you can see who's watching, who's like, you're just always evaluating everything that's going on. Film is an unbelievable tool for coaches to get their message across. Um, and then also to see, right? To see certain, uh, to kind of observe and, and notice things that you might be able to see, um, whether it's in practice. When you're talking about your players and you're showing them the different clips and you're using some clips to motivate guys that, Hey, here's what you're doing. And we need you to do better than that. And then you're showing other guys like, Hey, look at this, this guy, this is why this guy plays. And I think one of the things that coaches sometimes struggle with is that ability to inspire every guy on the roster to give their best, right? You want your first, your best player to play as hard as they can. And you want your 15th guy to be playing as hard as they possibly can. And you want them to be competing all the time with each other and pushing one another. And yet at the same time, you want to develop that team cohesion. You want them when the game starts, you want them all to be pulling for one another. So how do you balance that desire for internal competition, which sometimes can breed some friction with that team cohesion that you need on game night to make sure that everybody's rolling the boat in the same direction. Yeah. So I I think it all starts with recruiting and getting the right people in your program. So um, expectations are premeditated resentments. All right. If I set up a wrong expect, if I set up an expectation that you're going to play 40 minutes and you get to college and you don't, you're going to resent me. Our relationship is going to be soured and it might get to a point of no return. If I think you're a good student, you try hard, you have high character and you live basketball and you're not, my expectations probably won't be met and there's going to be some friction. So I, I always think it starts with establishing the right expectations for your program in the recruiting process. Okay. And then getting those people in your program that understand exactly what you value and understand what the behaviors um, that you are tying to those values. One of those is competitiveness, right? One of them is humility. I mean, we have a lot of them, right? And we attach behaviors to all these things. Um, Great book by Tim Galloway, The Inner Game of Tennis. And I think we talk about this with our program a lot. And he has a chapter on competition. And in his mind, Tim Galloway would say he wants his opponents to play at their absolute best because competition is a chance to test yourself to see how far you can achieve, right, and how great you can be. We tell that to our players as well. You want to have this friendly competition, right? It can't be the the dark side of competition. It's got to be the light side of competition where everyone's trying to make everyone else better. You're being a leader in that regard. And really what you want is everyone to be at their best 
so that you can see how great you can be. And I know it's hard with young people, but again, it does start in the recruiting process and it starts with how you talk about things each and every single day, because that is what it is, it's messaging, right? And then rewarding the behaviors. We had a clip last year where our backup, we had a, we had a seven foot one center, he's amazing, defensive player of the year, led the country in blocks. It's his first year at our school, he's a transfer, and our uh, incumbent center on film was coaching him. That was one of our clips the next day. And what we talked about was, hey, look at this. This is leadership. This is about competition. Tony Lopez is teaching and coaching Major Majak, even though they're competing for the same minutes. How many other adults could do that in this room? Why aren't you doing it in this room? I mean, you got to find these winning moments, right? And the winning moments when you're watching film, I mean, find funny moments on film. I know I keep going back to watching practice film, but Every once in a while, like when a guy falls, that will be the last clip, right? Or if a guy gets dunked on, or <laughs> if someone's dancing after a three, we show those things. Like you're just trying to show the things that you want to celebrate, the, the winning moments that you can find on any day of your practice. But that is what we're trying to get. It's not always perfect, but you know, there's an expectation that uh, guys are competitive each and every day, regardless of the outcome for them, right? Whether it's playing time, making shots, missing shots. But again, it goes back to who you bring in your program and what you talk about on a day to day basis and then what re behaviors you reward or what you show on film. So I think, I mean, it's all encompassing, but it's a hard thing to balance. But, um, you know, not everyone's going to be happy and um, not everyone's going to get what they want, but you're trying to build a championship program. And obviously, it's always got to be about the team first, which is hard for young people and hard for adults sometimes as well. It is. And I think it's something that you have to, as you said, you have to constantly preach and I love the idea of what you talked about when you have to find those behaviors, right? So you can talk all you want about, Hey, we want this, we want that. But when those things happen, if you or your coaching staff isn't recognizing them, yes, eventually those things just kind of peter out and go away because the kid says, yeah, they're talking about it, but they don't really ever recognize it. They're not yeah. seeing the things that right. they're, they're, they're saying these things, but they're not really seeing me. here. I am, right. I'm doing this and I'm, I'm guy 14 on the roster. And every day I'm yeah. bringing enthusiasm and I'm diving on the floor. And yeah, maybe I'm not a starter. Maybe I'm not a guy that's impacting winning and losing on game day, but all throughout the week and just my presence, I'm doing all the things that I'm being asked to do. And when those things aren't recognized, it's really, really easy to have that kid just kind of get lost and yeah. right. not, not feel like they're not feel like they're a part of it. And I think coaches have to be really intentional. And I know that I'm sure you've been a part of or heard of or talked to other coaches who've had situations where you have a pretty good team, but the back end of the bench ends up going south. And then you have guys grumbling and doing things. And before you know it, you're spending a lot of time as a coach trying to problem solve players, 12, 13, 14 on your roster that yeah, no, really absolutely. honestly don't have anything to do with what's going on out on the floor. And you end up spending such an inordinate amount of time with those players. That's a lesson that I learned yeah. really early in my coaching career is you've got yeah. to figure out how do you keep those guys engaged and feeling like a part of it? Because if you don't, it's very easy for that to turn bad very quickly. Yeah. And I think you can use film with that, right? That's how you highlight their impact. You know, coaching used to be there's 15 guys in the team. They all had to adapt to one personality, which was that coach. I mean, that's how it was when I grew up, right? That's the... Um, you know, the top down, the hierarchical leadership model. I think it's so different now. And I'm not saying it's it's, it's a lateral leadership dynamic because we're still the adults in the room, right? With the high school, with college. But now it's one coach has to adapt to 14 guys or 15 guys. And you have to try your, you have to be intentional about trying to give every guy a little bit what he wants. And they all want something different. You know, one of the things I think that you need to do in your office is talk about every guy. And honestly, every day, hey, where is Jason at? You know, hey, What's Mike doing? Hey, why don't you get with Mike after and shoot with him? I think one of the most powerful things a head coach can do is just go rebound for your 15th guy after practice. It's a small gesture, um, but I, I, I've often thought that one of the most powerful things I can do as a head coach is to stay around after and grab the guys that don't play a lot and rebound for them. And you might not even have to say anything to them, but man, that is such a meaningful thing for those kids. And it does, and you, you'll see after you're done how much they appreciate it. It's just, you'll feel it. You got to give them something, right? Because they're not getting what they want, all right? And not everybody can. And we, and we discuss that in our program, but you have to be really intentional and you have to be really thoughtful about everyone in your program. And again, 
you're not going to align yourself with every single human being. Uh, there's going to be some kids that don't like the way you operate. You're going to not like the way some kids operate, but you really have to be great with your staff and be really intentional about you know where some of these guys are um, throughout the season and find little ways, whether it's film or rebounding, just to let them know that they matter. Right. And I think that's um, I think it helps your whole program, to be honest with you. Uh, and kids stick around a little longer afterwards, too. Right. Instead of all just leaving when the ball rings. Absolutely. When you look at the success that you've been able to have at New Haven, if you could point to one or two things that you think are indispensable to the success you've had, what would those things be? I mean, hard work is one. I know it's simple, uh, but it is, right? It's um, it's an obsession, right? You And I think it's a, it's a constant learning where you're trying to make your program better every day, right? It's why you're reading books. It's why you're watching film. It's why you're you know, uh, calling your guys in the summer. Um, and I think when we've been really good and we've had some success, like I think we've been really intentional about recruiting and not um, not really looking at talent uh, just because of a talented player is more to it than talent. Um, but yeah, I think we've created a learning environment where people can grow, develop. And um, I think we've created some measure of psychological safety, right? Where kids can also be themselves and um, be in an arena where it's, um, where it's safe, to be honest with you. Final question, two parts. Number one, your biggest challenge as you look forward over the next year or two. And then the second part, your biggest joy. When you get up in the morning, you think about what you get to do as the head coach at New Haven, what brings you the most joy? Yeah, biggest challenge every day is what you give your attention to. And I know that's for me, right? Being very intentional about how to improve uh, not only yourself, but the people around you, your program, uh, your family. So just being very intentional about uh, what I give my attention to and uh, trying to edit my life in a way that eliminates some of the stuff that um, isn't important. And then the biggest joy is, man, I get to coach, I get to coach hoops. You know, I get uh, Dwayne Brooks was a football coach at Yale is now at Dartmouth. He used to tell me he wakes up giggling every morning. And I use that same line. I, I, get, I wake up giggling every morning because um, I have great purpose in my life. I get to coach college basketball. I get to help young people. Uh, in this great game, be a little bit better at what they do and hopefully help them run other areas along the way, get to connect with other college coaches on a daily basis who have become close friends and talk hoops. And, um, you know, we had a coaching clinic on Tuesday. We had about 30 guys come in and just uh, rap, rap about basketball and leadership and, and team building and stuff like that. So, you know, those are the things um, that give me the greatest joy and uh, able to do that every day, which is, uh, which is pretty incredible. Before we wrap up, Ted, I want to give you a chance to share how people can reach out to you, find out more about you, your programs, whether you want to share a website, social media, email, just so how people can, again, reach out to you and, and connect. Sure. My email is thoteling at newhaven.edu. Um, you can find me on Twitter uh, sporadically, not so often, but at Ted Hotelling. Um I also, I have a newsletter, I guess it's called a newsletter, but I, I shoot an email out every Friday, usually a lot of coaching material, leadership material, uh, some podcasts thrown in there. Um, so if you want to get on my, my email blast, I've done it for about six years now. Um, if you want to get on that, just send me an email. We'll put you on the list. But um, yeah, uh, email me and call me if you have any questions about our program. We'd, uh, we'd love to talk. Ted's email newsletter is awesome. So if you are out there and you're listening and you get a chance to subscribe to it, I would highly recommend it. Since Ted and I got connected, I've been fortunate enough to receive the newsletter and there's a, just a ton of great stuff in there for coaches. And again, we, we talked about it kind of off podcast, but it's really, it's really well done. And I, I know you're proud of it. And as you talked about um, when, when we talk kind of off air, it, it forces you to kind of keep reading and keep up to date. And when you're finding it and putting that thing together, and it's really well done. So anybody yeah. in our audience who wants to subscribe to that, please make sure that you do also want to give a quick shout out to Josh Merkel, who we mentioned earlier in the podcast, but Josh was nice enough to connect Ted and I uh, and make this podcast possible. So again, thank you, Josh, for, for the connection here. Really appreciate it. And that's really what the podcast has been all about is, is building relationships and making connections. And so, or we're appreciative of any of our guests that share their contact information with us. So shout out to Josh and, and thank you. And then Ted, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule tonight to jump on with us and record. Really appreciate it. I thought it's been uh, just a tremendous conversation with a lot of information out there for coaches at all levels that you can put to use in your career and make yourself a better coach. So Ted, thank you. 
And to everyone out there, thanks for listening. And we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.